La Perouse and his crew beat the mail delivery across Siberia by only a few days, though after a year at sea, each hour was surely felt. La Perouse was promoted to rear admiral and was tasked with sailing south to examine claims of the British setting up a colony at New South Wales, Australia. Before setting out, the crew had time to relax, to hike the nearby volcanic mountains, to hunt with locals, to indulge in a sauna bath, to reconnoiter at the graves of Louis de Lila de Croyer, an astronomer who died of scurvy in 1741 while serving on Barron's second expedition, as well as Captain Charles Clerk, commander of the Discovery after Cook's death, who died of tuberculosis on his 38th birthday in August of 1779. As it snowed before the autumn equinox and nobody wanted to push their luck too far, this far north, plans were made and set out, and documents, journals, charts, and logs were packaged in waterproof boxes and given to a young man, Bartolome de Lesseps, a crewman and Russian interpreter, to cross Siberia, the reverse course of Ledger, if you will, by foot to hand deliver them to the French government. As La Perouse sailed south on October 7, 1787, Lesseps began his journey east, though it would take him until May to get to Auguste. By that time, Ledyard was long gone. Welcome to Expeditions, a podcast around Lewis and Clark. We explore the history and historiography of the expedition one day at a time. We are everywhere at Expeditions Pod. That's social media, Patreon if you want to support the show, as well as our website. We are currently in Mile Marker 2, episode Foul Weather. Ledyard would end up living with Billings for a time, quote, as one of his family and his friend, end quote. Over the course of December, we can imagine them together around town or back at the bar slash inn slash wherever we put them last episode. We can imagine them talking about James Cook and that final voyage and how impactful it was to them personally, but also how it diverted the treasuries of multiple nations and impacted and will impact the lives of countless indigenous peoples across the world. As an Oregonian for the last 12 years of my life, I've been drawn to the rugged coastline so different from the beaches that I visited when I was a kid. The Rehoboth Beaches, Virginia Beach, Hatteras, and the Outer Banks. As a fan of Barry Lopez, we'll imagine them talking about March 7th, 1778, when they sailed up the Oregon coast looking for New Albion, as Francis Drake called it. Captain Cook wrote of that day, quote, In this situation, we have 73 fathoms water over a muddy bottom, and about a league further off found 90 fathoms. The land appeared to be of a moderate height, diversified with hills and valleys, and almost everywhere covered with wood. There was, however, no very striking object on any part of it, except one hill, whose elevated summit was flat. This bore east from us, at noon. At the northern extreme of the land formed a point, which I call Cape Foulweather, from the very bad weather that we soon after met with. End quote. Ledyard said it was the ruggedest weather he had ever experienced cold, the gales of wind were successive and strong and sometimes very violent. Cook called it thick and hazy and blowing in squalls with hail and sleet. They were forced off the coast for an entire week, not unlike the months forced from forward momentum toward the Siberian coast. To quote David McCandry, Cook created a template for scientific discovery, in contrast to the overtly imperialist orientation of the preceding era, what might be called the Age of Columbus, end quote. That shift from the Spanish conquistadors and their drive for riches and filling in the white areas of maps that we saw during La Perouse's stop in Monterey, to pathways more integrationist in the French and colonialist in the British, took time and separate spheres of influence to come into their own. For the British, early exploration mirrored the future French and Russian reactions to Cook, only in the late 15th century. Five years into the age of Columbus, Henry VII dispatched, quote, another Genoese like Columbus, end quote, John Cabot, into the New World. If he died at sea or landed in Newfoundland and lived amongst the peoples, we're still unsure to this day. 
Slowly, the tolls of continued Atlantic voyages, namely in search of a mythic Northwest Passage, made the realization of a North American home base, if you will, more desirable. Queen Elizabeth I was a believer, and privateers and advisors like Humphrey Gilbert and Francis Drake pushed the cause of colonizing, as opposed to finding trade routes or just pure extraction. The Roanoke Colony in 1585 was a mixture of both, as Walter Raleigh dropped some settlers off on his way, like Coronado, and searched for cities of gold, though, like Cabot, those settlers mysteriously disappeared. Importantly, a blockade of Spanish merchants into Newfoundland, indeed a continuation of domestic conflict into the colonies, focused imperial energies for both nations into separate spheres on a largely unexplored and unmapped North American continent. The cost-benefit analysis of colonizing and extracting America's natural resources took years to complete. To offset the Crown's burden, namely financing and maintenance, the creation of the Plymouth Company and the London, or Virginia Company, allowed for repayment of investments, if profitable. For this scheme, like future land speculation that we'll see along our journey, so much hinges upon the made-up idea that the monarchy's land grants were real things that it could give to settlers who played nice. Again, so much of this entire age, all the way to Lewis and Clark, if not to our own time, is predicated upon dubious mythologies, like the doctrine of discovery or hereditary monarchies. After stops and starts, the colony of Jamestown was settled in 1607, followed by the Mayflower landing in Plymouth in 1620, along with colonies in the Caribbean. The descendants of the Lewises, Clarks, Merriweathers, and Rogers arrived shortly after this time into a world of tense relations with native peoples and tobacco labor camps more and more dependent on bound labor. Over time, the extreme profitability of their sugar camps in the Caribbean would calcify the logic of social and class relations in the 13 colonies where our story effectively begins, though not without its challenges, namely Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, which we'll touch on later. In its own feedback loop, the metropole grew more stratified, thanks to the imperial plunder benefiting the few, and the colonies, especially after class and enslaved rebellions, began to resemble it more and more. Yet, for those outside of that privileged loop, the new world, if only for the boundless land, was seen, and maybe it still is, as a place where one can start again. More colonies formed, more nations moved in to trade and settle, Culture and philosophy from the metropole began to be interpreted overseas in religious debates, slave codes, and for the future war of independence in the realm of republicanism and taxation. As the centuries progressed, Spain and France, and to a lesser degree Russia, began to press against Britain in North America, extensions of hundreds of years of continual warfare on mainland Europe. The Seven Years' War from 1754 to 1763, known as the French and Indian War in the U.S., was itself a continuation of the proxy beaver wars fought over the 17th century. Ledyard grew up in the shifting world, while La Perouse was part of this loss during the 1758 Siege of Loisbourg, which the following year became the staging ground for the Battle of Quebec, James Wolfe's fleet sailing up the St. Lawrence River after it was surveyed and mapped by none other than Captain James Cook to end French rule in North America. There's no easy way to summarize hundreds of years into a short history podcast, but seeing this mile marker and then Lewis and Clark traveling through history will hopefully set foundations for our study of the past, as well as seeing parallels to our present and the struggles for the future. If the age of Columbus gave way to the age of Cook, it coincided with the age of revolutions, though those on the resolution and discovery couldn't quite know all of that. In fact, Cook's voyages were so respected that, despite French blockades and engagements during their support of the American cause, Cook was not only declared off-limits to stops and seizures, but was to be engaged in whatever assistance he needed to complete his expedition. Cape Fowler is a minor event in Cook's storied voyages, though its impact, for us at least, cannot be easily gauged. For Billings, he was an assistant to astronomer William Bailey, a veteran of Cook's second voyage, and it was an opportunity for them to put their data to the test and protect the boats from catastrophe along the coast. For Ledyard, upon the storm subsiding, he'd comment on the natural world from Oregon to Nootka Sound, writing that, quote, 
the variety of its animals and the richness of their fur. They have foxes, sables, hares, marmosets, air mines, weasels, bears, wolves, deer, moose, dogs, otters, beavers, and a species of weasel called the glutton. The skin of this animal was sold at Kamchatka, a Russian factory on the Asiatic coast." End quote. The ships got a crash course on the Northwest, where they would expand on that knowledge as they crossed the enormous bars and sounds on their way to examining for one of the final times if there was such a passage across the continent that for centuries explorers and conquistadors and bureaucrats and businessmen had dreamed of. Mm-hmm.